Hello everyone, I'm Shalina, the Children's and Youth Program Director here at Impact Life Church. Welcome or welcome back to Impact Life Church's online experience. After the message, it would be great if you could take a moment to like this video or subscribe. But most importantly, we hope that what you hear impacts you so that you can go and impact generations for Jesus. When I tried to keep the law, it only condemned me, so I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all of its requirements so that I might live for it. My old self was crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I forget the past and look forward to what lies ahead. It is very clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. It is through faith that a righteous person has life. That's why we live by faith. Everyone, we're so glad you're here. How many glad you came to church this morning? Man, oh, it's awesome to be alive. It's awesome to be with you this morning. Thank you for coming. And those that are, if this is your first time here, or maybe you've been here a few times, we just want to let you know you belong here. And we're so thrilled and honored to, to meet you. And man, I hope that you find some friendly faces around here, because this is a friendly bunch. <laughs> it's kind of important. This is who we are. I mean, Jesus said, you'll know each other by your love. And so, man, our arms of love and acceptance, we just welcome you in here. We're so glad that you came. Welcome to the family. So if you got your Bibles with you, I want you to turn with me. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to just get rid of that. That doesn't need to be in my mouth while I talk. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just like what my wife said, we are just finishing up our series that we've been working on for the past, well, I guess, three months. And uh, how many of you learned some things over talking about grace and faith? Has it been helpful? Has it been, man, I know I've been encouraged. I've been strengthened, man, and I'm ready to continue on in this. But I know the Lord's got a few things that we're going to continue on starting in the next week. But in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, and again, we've been talking about grace and faith, getting rooted and established in this message, in this understanding. Because, I mean, you know, it's one thing just to know all about the grace of God. That's awesome. And we know grace to be, you know, it's God's goodness, His love that He's poured out towards you free of charge. Right? I mean, it cost Him His Son. He paid all the price for you. It's His grace. It's His kindness. But just because He's provided all these things doesn't automatically mean you're going to walk in it. What does it require to walk in what he's already provided? Faith. And so faith then is simply a response to what grace has already done. So again, we've spent countless time and hours on this. So I want to encourage you, if you want to get some of these messages, you can go to the website. We have a podcast. You can download the podcast on your little phone there. It's, it's great to, while you're driving, while you're in the gym, while you're pumping iron, or while you're showering, well, you know, whatever you're doing, you can put it in your ears and just hear it because, let me tell you, if we understand grace and faith and how it works, your relationship with God will flow to a whole nother level. Amen. I believe that. It's, this is how heaven operates. It operates. Everything God does is by His grace, and we receive it through faith. And so we're going to finish up with this, what we've been talking about. So in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says this, For we walk, how? By faith. By faith. Everybody say, by faith. by faith. And not by sight. So, and I, man, I love this. We said this over in four different verses. We saw that the just, those that have been declared righteous by God, they are living a particular way. You know that scripture we read in Colossians chapter 1, we've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness. And where have we been placed? Into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Now, in the kingdom of darkness, there is a lifestyle. There is a way of living. But once you've been taken out of that kingdom, you've been brought into a brand new kingdom. There is a brand new way of living. And God calls it, you live how? By faith. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't a movement. This isn't just, you know, a arm stream where, you know, the, you know, there's a certain group of people that are called to live by faith and other Christians can live however they want. If you are a child of God, You've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Guess what? You're in, the, you're in the family. Now God says that He requires it of you and I to live a particular way. We are called to live by faith. Now I love that walking by faith means it's steps. So this is exactly what we're going to be talking about. It's just steps of faith. This is who we are. This is what we're about. But we are faith people. Say it, I'm a faith person. Man, what does that mean? 
Well, for one thing, I'm pleasing God. Another thing is I'm actually receiving from Him. Man, faith without faith, what does the Bible say? It is hard to do. It is what? It's impossible to please God. But with faith, guess what? You're pleasing to Him. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the desire of my heart for my personal life, for the family that I'm raising, for the church we have. I want everything to be pleasing to Him. Anybody else want that? So how do you have to do that? How do you do it? How do you have to live? By faith. And we're going to talk about that this morning. Are we okay with that? Are you excited about pleasing God? All right, cool. So when we say we walk by faith, not by sight, what we are saying, I just want to edif- or clarify a few things. But this again is a transition from sight and emotional living to a lifestyle where we live by what God has said. So it's just a transition. We're learning to live. And that's what Jamie said so eloquently last week is we're, we're learning this faith life. Everybody say learn it. Right? You've got to learn it. So again, something that you've got to change, maybe some lifestyle. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause you to change. It's going to cause you to adjust your living. But is it worth it? Absolutely it's worth it. Walking with Him, there's nothing better than walking with Him. But again, I want to just really clarify here. It does not say to decrease your emotions. It just says we don't live by them. Because a lot of people think, well, okay, now that I'm a faith person, I'm not allowed to have emotions. That's not the case. That's not true. The Bible doesn't say, for we walk by faith and you better not have any emotions. We have emotions. God gave us emotions. How many of you thankful you have emotions? You can feel things. Anybody... You know, enjoying a good feeling once in a while. Some of you are just saying, I hate feelings. Well, man, you better enjoy them. God gave them to you. He just said, don't live by them. Don't let them lead you in the decisions that you make. So we walk by faith, not by sight. So rather than us letting the emotions dictate our feelings or how we're going to live our lives, we're going to let what God says now dictate how we're going to live our life. Right? So now let's just talk a little bit about this for a moment, but sight or emotionally driven lifestyle. Let's just talk about this for a moment. And while you're thinking about what it means to be walking by emotions or senses, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I want to start in verse 9. But if you think about it, emotional living, what is it? What comes to your mind? Like a C, yeah. <laughs> up, down. What happens? You wake up on the right side of the bed? Up. All of a sudden, something bad happened in your day? No. <laughs> But then your wife gave you a good kiss when you got home. Oh, peek up a little bit. And then your kid starts crying because you think you gave him the wrong color of plate. Down. It is just an emotional roller coaster. You're, ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And before you know it, you, what, who am I? What is wrong with me? You're an emotional head case because your emotions are dictating how you live. You're allowing external circumstances to dictate to you how I'm going to live. If you just think about that for a moment, my life is going to be totally dependent on how Jamie behaves and how she is. (laughs) She makes tacos for dinner. Oh, God. Trust me, the opportunity is there. Why do you have to make that every day? And then she corrects me. We made it about six months ago. I don't care. It felt like yesterday. Now, I could come home after a long, hard day of work, man, I'm... Just putting it all in there. You come home. Tacos. It's there. Anybody ever experienced that before? <laughs> no. Oh, no. So tacos perk you people up. Okay, now, now we know. Now we know. All right. Well, we got an announcement for you after. But you can, it's cra- if you just think about it, all these external things can dictate how I'm going to live my life. I'm angry because so-and-so did this to me. <sighs> and I can get, I could totally lose it. I'm just, you know, frustrated. And listen, this is a big one, especially in the political realm and with the election coming up. People are just angry. At what? At what was done to them or how they feel or they just don't like that person. All these emotions come. Somebody else is running your life. And you don't even realize it. You think you're justified to be mad. Here we are as Christians. I'm just angry. You look like you just had tacos. <laughs> got him this straight up but external circumstances dictate how you live and if you actually think about it living this way or external circumstances dictating how we live the potential that the enemy is running your life is pretty high simply because the enemy where does he operate where does he live he lives in the external realm 
He can change things. He could bring circumstances. He could bring distractions your way. And you're reacting to a circumstance out here, not thinking, oh, I'm still a Christian. You're still a Christian. But the enemy is actually running your show. He's running your life because you're so angry about what takes place over here. So I want to just show you this. So why we do not live and operate by our emotions or by sight. And I want to show you this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And look at verse 9 here for a sec. So if you read it all through this, Paul is just talking about the wisdom of God. I mean, he's talking to those that are wise or that are spiritual, word people, we speak wise. But those that are carnal, meaning they're just flesh people, natural thinking, well, we got to preach, we got to talk to them naturally speaking. So why do we not live our life emotion-led? Why are we not living our life based on circumstances? Well, right here, 1 Corinthians 2.9, this is in the, in the Passion Bible, it says, this is what the scriptures say, Things never discovered or heard of before. Things beyond our ability to imagine. These are the many things God has in store for all of his lovers. Now other translations say it like this. What eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, neither has entered into the mind of man all the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So this tells me if I'm going to live this life by, my, by the circumstances, by sight, by just the natural level, I will never understand what God has in store for me. Personally, I'll never know what God's plan for my life is. And another thing is I'll never actually know what God's will is on this earth. Because you cannot dictate the will of God based on circumstances. You can't base the will of God on situations or experiences that you've had. You can't base it on experiences that other people had. Right? Just be, well, I heard people say, well, I've prayed. I prayed God for their healing and it didn't happen. So it must not be His will. Says who? Well, my experience told me, yeah, but the Word of God says that if you lay hands on the sick that they shall recover. So I have to choose either between your experience or what God says. And I don't know about you, but I'm choosing God's side. Even though my experience may not line up, does not mean I changed and altered the word of God, what he said to go down with the experience. What do I need to do? I need to change that experience to line up now with what the word says. Can you see this? This is a huge difference and where a lot of people miss it. Romans chapter 3. I mean, I just, I had a, you know, a couple a little while ago, individuals say to me, well, we prayed for somebody and they actually died. Well, I mean, wh wh what was the problem? Well, hey, hey, we win. If they're a born again Christian, they, we still win. But it's not, listen, there's so much stuff that is in private inside of a person that you don't know and you can't call the shots. If they had a desire to go, you can't keep them. You're not in charge of them. It's, you can't override their will with your own will and what you want. There's his own personal thing. But instead, even in all this, I mean, Romans chapter 3 says this, Paul said, let every man be a liar and God be found true. So just because you've had some experiences, you prayed to God for something and it didn't happen, don't just throw it away and say, oh, okay, well, I guess it's just, we never know what's going to be God's will. That's coming from a very carnal perspective, very natural perspective. Instead, we need to be living by faith. And what is living by faith? It's living by what God has already said. That's simply what faith is. We live by what he has already said. Now, let me just, clear. let's continue on with this for a bit. Living by faith, then, what is living by faith? This is living life in the highest form of reality. Now, when you hear the words living by faith, I don't want you to think, get kind of weird in your thinking. Just right away start thinking, going by what God said. So when I say faith, live by faith, what do you automatically need to be thinking? I live by what God said. Live by faith. All right, three of us got it. Live by faith. Live by faith. Live by faith. Live by sight. I don't know. This is a good example. We live by faith, meaning we live by what God has already said. So this again now is the highest form of reality. When you live your life based on what he said, you are now living the highest form of life that there is. Is there anything higher than what God said? No, this is it. This is the highest form. Secondly, the word of God dictates how I live completely independent of what happens in the natural realm. Because what I hear from God may be totally opposite of what I'm seeing out here. What am I going to believe? Do I going to stick with God, what he said to me, or am I going to go by what this says out here? Yeah, but you know, the market says this and the housing market's doing this. If God told you to sell, what are you going to do? Yeah, but you don't understand the market is going down. 
But he said, sell. What are you going to do? See, this is where the pressure comes. I don't think it's the right time. If he told you, where are you basing your life off of? See, it just comes into those, some of those simple things. Just going by what he said. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, it says, this is Jesus speaking. He said, man does not live by bread alone. Rather, he lives on every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is how we live. Say, this is how I live. This is your lifestyle now. It's not going by what happens out here. Now, I'm not saying throw out common sense. Of course, if you're crossing the road, open your eyes. Right? <laughs> But I'm talking about you're making decisions in life. You're doing life. You need to be putting such an emphasis on hearing from him. What has he got to say about my situation? Okay. Now going again, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Now look at this. Now why do I need to live by what God says? I'll show you a couple of these verses. So remember the verse before? Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered the heart of man. All the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Now look at verse 10. But God. Everybody say, but God. Now unveils these profound realities to us how by his spirit so all the things that god has prepared for you he's now revealed it to you not through the natural circumstances so just because they offer you a job that's going to give you 100 grand more a year it's not a leading it could cause you the biggest problems in your entire life but we're going oh this is what this looks good over here this happens to be over here that is not dictating just because you get a raise that's god's in this nothing to do with it you can't be moved by those things what do i have to be moved by now god reveals these things these profound realities to us how by his spirit check on the inside of you right yes he has revealed to us his inmost heart and deepest mysteries through the holy spirit who constantly explores all things continue verse 11 goes on to say um after all who can really see into a person's heart and know his hidden impulses except for that person's spirit so it is with god his thoughts and secrets are only fully understood by his spirit the spirit of god and verse 13 says for we did say me for me i did not receive the spirit of this world system but the spirit of god so that i might come to understand and experience all that grace has lavished upon us guess what spirits on the inside of you Jesus' spirit is on the inside of you. Now you can know every thought that he has, you can know it. Boo, yeah. yeah. Verse 13, we'll continue reading this. And I want to just show you this because this separates. Paul really talks the difference between a spiritual person and to be a spiritual person is you're a person of the word versus someone who is carnal or natural. Right again, he's just showing these two different lifestyles. And it says, we articulate these realities with words imparted to us by the spirit and not with words taught by human wisdom, we join together spirit-revealed truths with spirit-revealed words. Click. Someone living... Sorry, there's a clock that's blocking my view on there. Someone living on an entirely human level. Now again, what is someone living on an entirely human level? What is that? Someone who is operating how? By faith or by sight? By sight. They're operating it by sight. Now what hap What does it say? Who is someone who's operating at this level? What does it say? They reject. And I'll just, in a little bit of a translation in the Aramaic, it actually says they do not have access to. They don't have access to it. Access to what? The revelations of God's Spirit. Um, did something just change on me? No? Okay. He rejects the revelations of God's Spirit for they make no sense to him. He can't understand the revelations of the Spirit because they are only discovered, how? By the illumination of the Spirit. Verse 15 goes on to say, Those who live in the Spirit, those who live according to the Word, what God says, are able to carefully evaluate what? Everybody say, all things. All things. And they are subjected to the scrutiny of no one but God. And then lastly, verse 16, 4. Who has ever intimately known the mind of the Lord Yahweh well enough to become his counselor? Naturally speaking, no one. But Christ has, and we possess Christ's perceptions. This is what you have. So why do we want to live by faith? It's because now I'm a perceiver of what he thinks. I can get it. I can understand it. Somebody say that. I can understand it. You don't have to be ignorant anymore. My stupid days are over. 
But if you want to remain stupid, it means you remain living by the natural realm. Well, this just doesn't make any sense to me. Faith doesn't say anything about making sense. You just have to trust them. <laughs> it doesn't have to make sense. Well, huh, why do I have to do it this way? If he asks you to do it, just do it. Right? Okay, I'm glad that all makes sense. Now, why do we live by what God says? Here it is. Number one is you will understand what his will is. Secondly, you will know his plan for your life. Thirdly, you don't need to keep looking for a feeling to make you feel okay. Is the word just not enough for you? Like this is where we got to get to as believers is that our emotions are driving us so much that we jump from conference to conference, service to service, meeting to meeting, looking for a feeling. God, I need to feel you. I need to feel your tangible presence on because I don't know if you're with me. God said, I'll never leave you. Is that not enough? So rather than, this is what happens with Christians, they jump from thing to thing, meeting to meeting, you know, conference to conference, looking, speaker to speaker, looking for a feeling in a meeting. And when they feel it, oh, this was it, man, this was it. And then you'll follow that guy or that woman around all over the place looking for that feeling again, and you may not get it the next time you go. So what's happening is we got a lot of Christians that are led by their feelings rather than going by what he said. He said, I love you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Yet we're still on our knees. God be with me. That is a waste of breath. He already said it. So we have got to live our life based on what he said, not on how I feel about the situation. He said he'll never leave me nor forsake me. I can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. No matter what I face, no matter what comes my way, this is what he said. Lord, I trust you in this. That is living by faith. Cool? Okay, just, you know, air five me for a moment if we're all... Okay. <laughs> And thirdly, or sorry, that was thirdly. Lastly, the Word of God is the only foundation for emotional stability. It's the only foundation. So if your emotions are all over the map, like what Johanna said, you'll feel like a sea up and down and all the way around. Guess what? The answer is to get rooted in what He said. Let His Word be the ultimate truth because really, emotional stability is the evidence of spirituality. It's the evidence for it. If you see somebody who can control their emotions, they're in charge of it, guess what? That person is ruled by the Word of God. You can see it. Right? But somebody who's all over the map, the Word of God is not their final authority. You can just see it right off the get-go. Right? Okay. So no matter where you are, no condemnation, just go, okay, I'm a little bit of an emotional person. Maybe I'm quite an emotional person. What do I got to do? I'm going to just get into the Word. I'm going to let the Word now, I'm going to bring my life to the Word so that my life reflects what this says. It's all it is. It's, it's a choice, right? It's not something that you can, oh, how do I do this? Just make a choice. The Word is going to be my final authority for how I live my life. And go by that. Every time the Word says something, okay, I'm going to put my life to that, right? So again, now it's vital that you and I, we develop a craving for the Word of God. As Christians, we got to come back to the very foundational truth of Man, this is the word. This is what God has said. I'm going to stick with what he has said. Got to get back to the basics, right? Okay. Psalm 119, verse 14, the psalmist said, I have rejoiced in your law as much as in riches. So how do you know <laughs> that you're craving God? Is you get excited about his word. When was the last time all of a sudden you went into your devotional time with the Lord and you were just jacked? I get to go be at the Word today. Can anybody remember that time? <laughs> when was the last time when you said, man, today's Sunday, I get to go to church? Are you kidding me? Woo! Now just think about it. If it's not at that level of excitement, it just means that you're, you're working your way to craving. Come on, somebody. This is, we, we got to get this. We are Christians, are we not? Especially the way that the world is going. It is getting darker and darker out there. Our only way of survival and living properly and effectively in this whole generation we're in is to know what this says and to live by it. I said this last week, by the person who lives by what God says, a person who lives by faith does not have to change the style of their life. You don't got to change. Your lifestyle is still the same. Why? Because it's based on what he says. Rather than someone who doesn't live their life according to this, you will be up and down and all the way around, 
trying to figure out what is life? What am I supposed to do with all this? The Word is your anchor for stability and emotions. It'll bring it to you. It'll harness it, right? So let me encourage you. If you don't have a craving for God, well, where, how do I start? Where do I develop? Start eating it. Start spending time with this Word because the more that you feed on it, the more you're going to crave it. And the more that you crave it, what happens? The more you're going to feed it. And the more that you feed it, what's going to happen? The more you're going to crave it. And the more that you crave it, what's going to happen? Oh, come on, somebody. I'm sweating up here for y'all. So what's going to happen? You start to feed it, you start to crave it. You start to crave it, you start to feed it. It is a vicious cycle for anything in life. No matter what you feed on, if you feed on Big Macs, what's going to happen? You're going to crave Big Macs. Somebody throws a salad your way and you go, oh, forget it, Jack. There's salad in the Big Mac. You ain't doing that. So it's the same way as good in the natural same as in the spiritual, if you start feeding on this word, it may start off and just go, oh man, this is so hard to read. Good. Feed it to yourself. I don't want to eat veggies. You put it and you stick it in their mouth and you say, you eat that. Why? Because it's good for you. You need those nutrients in your body. Jesus said the same thing. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So we got to come to this place, Lord, I'm hungry for, I want this word. Because the moment, if we can start craving it, your life will go to a whole new level. Rather than just throwing a prayer, oh God, please help me. Get into this word and it'll change it. Jeremiah 15, 16, this is his words. He said, I, I found your words and I devour them. I just ate them all up. Now, we, we sang this last night, so let's just do it for a moment. We, uh, in youth group in 2005, when, you know, that was the really cool days. Anybody who was like a youth in 2005? Come on, 2005ers, where are you, man? We were, hey, Al, put your hand down. You just, you're old, man. <laughs> 2005, I think, was the cool year, right, man, for youth group. I remember I was youth pastoring or just about to be youth pastor. We used to sing this song, God's Word for Breakfast, God's Word for Lunch, God's Word for Dinner Now. Either this just shows where everybody's age group is at or I don't know what. But let's just all they say this together. God's Word for Breakfast, God's Word for Lunch, God's Word for Dinner Now. Oh, man, that's... All right. Whatever. But let me just give you an opportunity. This is a cool to let your, your inner gangsta out. Munch, 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 munch. We used to do that. I remember... Josh, do you remember doing that in Hawaii? Yeah, you do. Did you need to illustrate what you... No, you don't need to illustrate. Okay. <laughs> you sure? Yeah, you're... You sure? Okay, all right. Okay, okay. <laughs> We used, that was the song that we did. We we're just, we're getting youth pumped up. And remember, me and Josh used to do a, a song together. Do, are you, do you want to do it? <laughs> this is my Bible. We used to rap that thing together. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. <laughs> he forgot the lyrics. So we'll just, man, we were the Backstreet Boys, dude. Come on. But that's all right. But man, we used, to, we used to get all these youth pumped up. We'd grab them all in here. We'd be at this youth rally and all of a sudden, okay, Joel and Josh, I want you guys to lead the youth in this confession. And we'd put on some, like, some sweet rap and this is my Bible. I'm trying to make it as cool and as gangster as I possibly could. It's hard to do it with a really white song. <laughs> this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And last word, I can do what it says I can do. And we got all the youth to reply back to us. And I mean, in my eyes, in my eyes and in my vision, I could see the youth just jumping up. Yeah, yeah, preach it. This is my Bible. And meanwhile, we're doing our rap. We're all out here doing our thing. And they're just, I am what it says I am. Please come off the stage. You're just, this is horrible. So there you are. We go off the stage and we'll be here all night signing autographs in the back, right? So did anybody ask you for an autograph? No, me neither. Okay. But we got to get to the point. I remember doing this in youth. We got to get people hungry for the Word of God. Because when you're hungry for the Word, you're actually hungry for Him. People, again, are looking for experiences outside of what the Word of God says. He is His Word. When you crave His Word, guess what? You're craving Him, and you start to experience Him. Where? Through the Word. Rather than looking for some tangible feeling during a worship service, during a prayer time, Man, it is such so low. When you can feel something, thank God for that. When that comes, I, I appreciate it. I love it. That's, that's wonderful. But I'm not looking for it. 
Because if I look for it, I'll be very disappointed in my Christian life because God is a spirit. That's who He is. So listen, the best times that I've had with the Lord have been in my own room sitting in my white chair reading His Word and He just opened something up to me. Now when He opens that up, what the psalmist said, He said, I rejoice in your law as much as I do in riches. So man, it's rather than getting your own, here's my $500 Christmas bonus. Yeehaw, this is amazing. You get pumped over that. Well, God wants to reveal His Word to you. This is His desire. And the psalmist is saying, I rejoice in your law. Man, I love your word. When you open it up to my eyes, man, I get excited about it. We have to get to that point where we crave the word of God. Do you know how we're going to change a city? By craving the word of God. People think, well, I got to go out there and evangelize. What are you going to evangelize with? You got nothing in you. Meanwhile, we're trying to preach and trying to get everybody hyped up. Yeah, come to Jesus. It's amazing. This is so fun. Come to our party. They come to a service and their life still sucks. Why? Because there's no substance. There's nothing there. So what do we need? We need cravers of the Word of God. So when cravers are filled with God, they go out and talk to people who don't have God. They see God. They go, I want that. Think about that. What is the greatest way to evangelize? It's just being full of God. And it'll just come out of you. You don't even have to psych yourself up and, oh, oh, okay, I got this, I got this. Meanwhile, you just let it flow out of you. People are drawn to you. Again, a gentleman that I really enjoy following and reading after, Smith Wigglesworth. Anybody know that? He, uh, there's a few times in his, some of his books, he actually talks about people just coming into the, the cab. He was on a train going somewhere. They would just come into his cab and the gentleman, all just sitting, he's sitting down in the chair. Another gentleman would be sitting here. All of a sudden, you know, Smith maybe is just reading or he's, I think he took a nap even. Woke up and the guy was on his knees in front of him. <laughs> Never said anything. He said, I, f- I feel the Lord's conviction on me and I just come here to repent. What is that? You see that in the book of Acts. Peter's shadow healed people. Oh, I want that. God, I'm asking you that my shadow just be anointed. Shadow, you do stuff. Shadow, you whoosh. Shadow, do stuff. Whoosh. Oh, glory to God. We're trying to hype this thing up. Rather, when you're full of God, your shadow just comes, and the moment he walked by somebody, they're just healed. So what's the whole purpose? Is you got to crave him. you got to want him. This is the greatest beginning for the faith life, is you crave him. It's not just, okay, step one, two, three, this is how I do faith. No, when you crave the man, guess what? Faith becomes automatic in it. Oh, okay, I'm sweating a lot, so. Coat's coming off, people. Coat's coming off. It's 22 degrees in here. Oh, man. (laughs) All right. So living by faith. John chapter 2 and the verse 5. Let's turn there for a moment. Whew. Well, I hope so because I'm sweating, man. So. <laughs> now, I just believe that this church, we are specifically assigned here and called here to be God cravers. This is who we are. This is what it's all about. And the result of craving God is we'll have a greater impact on generations because of our craving. The greatest gift that my parents, that my grandparents could ever give me is their love for the Lord. The greatest thing that you can do as parents, if you've got grandchildren, you've got kids, you've got great grandkids, however it looks, the greatest thing that you can do for them is reveal and show them how much you love Jesus. It's the greatest turn on to me. It's, for me personally, I, I love it. My Oma is a fantastic example of that now. I watch her and I'm just, the spirit of faith is all over that woman. I could just watch her and I want to be like her when I get older. It's the greatest thing. You can actually see that in Timothy. Uh, Paul said that to Timothy. He said, man, like the, the genuine faith, he said that the, the genuine faith which was found in your grandmother and now in your mother is also now in you. It's the greatest thing you can pass on is just this genuine love for the Lord, this genuine craving for Him. Remember, even as a kid, what do I remember more than anything else? I mean, other than all the sports and the soccer things that I did, I remember my dad reading his Bible. My mom would read her Bible. Mom, what are you doing? Reading the Word. What are you doing? I don't know. You want to play something? Like, that's what I stuck out to me. And I still see those images. Man, I'd go out to the front deck. My dad or in his office, this is what he'd be doing. He'd be in his Word. He'd be studying. And he'd have all these different computers up for different study tools. This is what he did. And for me, that left the greatest impact on me. This is my dad. You giving your life to this? 
That's amazing. So parents, let me encourage you. Let your kids catch you reading your Bible. That was a huge revelation for me. My wife took a picture of Jamie, or uh, my wife took a picture of me, not herself, of me and Jace. We were at a Saturday night service and it just hit me. He's standing beside me. We both had our hands raised to the Lord during the worship time. And that just impacted me. And it says in Ephesians 5, 1, be imitators of God like dear children who imitate their parents. And I just thought, you know what? I'm going to let my kids catch me praising God. I'm going to let my kids catch me reading the word. All of a sudden they come up and, ah, what are you doing? And I got my Bible in my hands. I love when they see that because this morning even, <laughs> Max woke up early. We, I took Jace downstairs early this morning, so not a whole lot of sleep going around this past week. <laughs> but this morning, uh, Max, Jamie went and got him. He's in his room reading his Bible. Can he read? No, but he sure likes the pictures. <laughs> but think about it, man. You, you, what, you're leading the example for it. So I don't know about you, but especially in the city that we live in, what can they catch from us here at Impact Life Church? That we crave Jesus. More than anybody, more than anything else. More than I love people, I love Him. Because when I love Him, I'm able to effectively serve people. So if people can catch us serving God, so when, if anytime you're here, if this is your home church, if this is where you are, let me encourage you, let loose. Man, when we're worshiping God, put your hands in the air. Put your hands up in the... Worship Him. Bless Him. Make, come, just come in doing it. Because even though people from the outside they go, that's kind of weird, they'll be drawn and attracted to it because cravers attract people. When you go to a professional sporting event or something, you're not just paying to see these, these two teams play. You're paying to see perfection and people that crave a sport and they're performing in it. Think about that. That's what you're going to watch. When we come to church, man, we are here. I mean, one of those things that have always been said, let, let me catch on fire and let the world watch me. Let them watch us. We're the examples of what God lovers look like. That's not my message, but there you go. There you go. Okay, John chapter 2 and verse 5. We're talking about the faith life. So this is right after now talking. Uh, Jesus was invited to a wedding. They ran out of wine. All right, big problem, big, big, big thing going on. So Mary all of a sudden comes and says, you know, Jesus, they ran out of wine. Give them some more wine. Jesus said, what is it up to you, woman? It's not our problem. Move on. Then so Mary leaves, and as she leaves, she talks to one of the servants and says, hey, whatever he tells you, do it. She knew something. So now, right here, we find the key to living by faith. And if you guys can turn it to the New King James Version, I don't know if you can, but... It says it just this way, whatever he says to you, do it. So let's say that together. Whatever he says to you, do it. This is it. Right here. This is the answer. We find right here how to operate by faith. We find out also in this same place where people may have missed it in their faith walk. Whatever he says, number one, do it. So let's do that again. What's number one? Whatever he says, number two, do it. Okay. Now just reading these verses and understanding this truth, let me encourage you this, that do not mess up the order. There's only two things, so it should be very simple. <laughs> but don't mess up this order. Whatever he says to you is first. Secondly, okay, do it. <laughs> okay. Next, when you see this, whatever he says to you, do it. It requires that I, or that you have a living, up-to-date relationship with the Lord. Whatever he says to you. I love this, because when I see this, I go, he wants to talk to me. He wants to reveal things to me. But now it requires that I have an up-to-date relationship with him. When's the last time you sat in your white chair and let the Lord speak to you? He wants to talk to you. He wants to reveal things. Just because he said something to you 10 years ago doesn't mean that it's up to date right now. It's got to be fresh. You wouldn't need a, you know, a pie that was baked 10 years ago, would you? Let alone 10 weeks ago. 10 days ago, maybe. 10 minutes ago? Oh, now we're talking hot apple pie. Come on, somebody. Anybody want the 10, you know, 10 minute apple pie? Well, the Lord wants that up to date relationship. It's got to be fresh. Not this stale pie that's been on the windowsill for Lord knows how long with flies oozing around it. It's got to be fresh. Next, thirdly, is the Lord will lead you where your faith is, not where you pretend to be. Not where you pretend to be. He is willing to let you grow at your own rate. Get real with where you're at. 
And I think this is, is vital for some people because some people may be on stage one, but they think they're on stage seven. Abraham did not start off by God saying to him, sacrifice your only son and you will see him resurrected from the dead. Did he start there? No. Where did he start? Abraham or Abram, leave your family. That's where it started. His whole life started there. Don't just make stuff up. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't just looking for something to do. He heard from God. Leave your family. Okay, so what did he do? He left his family. Right? Can you see that? Yeah. Is it very easy? He heard. Yeah. He did. But now God is not going to say, I want you to sacrifice your only son, Isaac, on the altar and give him to me as an offering. That's not where he started. Where did he start? He started with, leave your family. So no matter where you are, whatever he says to you, no matter how small it is, it could be, I want you to get up 30 minutes early before work do it. But that obedience to that little thing will cause you to become a faith giant as you grow up into this. Nobody starts off by raising people from the dead. We're all called to it, but how come not everybody's doing it? We got to get there. So where do we got to start? We got to start in the little things. Pick up your Bible and read it. Yes, sir. So what am I going to do? I'm going to pick up my Bible and read it. Those little acts of obedience go a far way. Okay. <laughs> And then the lastly, a quick reality just on this truth is that we don't receive according to God's perfect will. We receive according to our faith. God's got this great will. He's got this great plan for you, but you don't receive based on God's perfect will. You receive according to your faith. Does that make sense? Are we? That, okay. How do I know that? Well, Matthew chapter 9, verse 29, Jesus said, according to your faith, let it be unto you didn't say according to my will, according to my desire for you. He said according to what you believe and what you've heard, be it unto you. So again, we do not receive according to what God's perfect will is for our life. We receive according to our measure of faith. So how do we grow that measure? Hear, do. Hear, do. According to what you're hearing, that's as deep as you can go. Yeah? Okay. Now let's, let's dive into this a little bit more. Now, these are a few areas where people have missed it. So if these are the steps, whatever he says, do it. So in the step, no, area number one, if where people may have missed it has been this in presumption. You are acting without a word. Anybody ever done that before? Yeah, I've done that before. Man, you just go out, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a shot. I'm going to give this a try. And did it work? No, it did not work. But this is where people miss it and they think these faith people are a bunch of weirdos. <laughs> Well, can I encourage you, you? You kind of are if you haven't heard anything. You're just going out trying these things and I'm going to do this. And people do the craziest things trying now to get something. That's not what he said. He said, whatever he tells you, do it. If he tells you to sit, sit. Don't go for a run. If he tells you to go to bed, oh Lord, I want to study. You're in disobedience. Go to bed. I've had that talk to me. The Lord had to get, you know, get on my case a little bit for this. I kind of felt I had this natural inclination. Okay, I got to prep. I got to study. I got to get into that word. I'm going to go, 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 go. The Lord told me, go to bed. I did not listen. So I stayed up a little bit later than I should have. Eventually, my sleep was horrible. My kids got up extremely early. That next day was a disaster. God, what is going on? I'm trying to go in this. I told you to go to bed. Go to bed. God can do more with your little act of obedience than you can on your own studying His Word. Okay. Maybe I'm just telling on myself this morning, but I'm just... Here it is. Presumption is simply acting without a word. You're acting on something that you have... Listen, have not heard. You're acting. Then he goes on, either you saw someone do it, or you assumed an answer, or this is what you did the last time. This is what happened the last time I ran into the situation, so I'm going to do it again because it worked. Man, I put on this worship song, and it just worked. I went for a lap around my house over and over for an hour, and it worked last time, so I'm going to try it again. That becomes a religious tradition, and that is not what he's telling you fresh to date. Are we, am I okay? Am I, am I just preaching about my... Okay, okay. And we saw this in uh, Hebrews 11, verse 29. We read this last week. But it says, it was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, notice this, they tried to follow. What was God saying to Moses? He told Moses, 
Stretch forth your hand and go across. So what was that? He heard. So what came? Faith came. Then he acted on it. Pharaoh, they saw the Egyptians tried to do the same thing. And what would God be saying to Pharaoh and all these armies? Turn around. Go away. Leave them alone. That would have been the answer that Pharaoh would have heard. And he would have been a living. But at this point, the Egyptians tried to do the same thing. And notice, 20,000 charioteers all drowned because they tried to do the same thing. Now, what does that mean? Because you saw somebody do it does not mean that's what you're supposed to do. Somebody gave a car away does not mean that you go, I'm going to do the same thing so that I can reap a good harvest too. You have to hear on your own. God gave you your own ears to hear. Isn't that wonderful that he wants to talk to you? Aren't you so glad that my life isn't based on Eric? Eric all of a sudden gives away his cool brand new rollerblades. And I go, oh man, I'm going to do the exact same thing because I want the newest kind of rollerblades. Eric goes in, he does it, and the Lord gives him a brand new pair of rollerblades. I do it, and I end up walking everywhere. <laughs> what is this? Do you like him more than you like me? No, I wasn't asking you to do that. So you have got to hear for yourself. And isn't that wonderful news, though, that he wants to talk to you? This should get you happy. Okay. So again, we have got to place a high importance on hearing in our life, because this is step one. Whatever he tells you, step one. Because how does faith come? Faith comes what? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes not by praying for it. You don't go, oh God, give me faith. I just need faith. That is not how it comes. Faith comes how? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then when you hear the word of God, let me encourage you, don't get tired of hearing even more. Don't ever think that you've heard John 3.16. Can I just say that again? Don't ever think that you've heard John 3.16. Because the moment you think you've heard it is the moment you stop listening and the stop right at that point is the Lord's not able to get more to you. So always live in this constant state, Lord, I am open to hear from you no matter what. Everybody, turn your Bible to John 3.16. Yeah, come on, God, what are you going to say to me? Have that attitude. <sighs> oh, just turn to your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5.7. Oh, I've heard that before. The moment you do that is the moment this, he stops talking to them. He can't get it to you. So everybody, turn your Bible, John 3, 16. Get it up. Let's do this. Let's go. It just puts an expectation on you hearing. Okay? I'm a little bit jacked. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. It says this. Listen carefully, my dear child, to everything that I teach you. And pay attention to all that I have to say. Verse 21. Fill your thoughts with my words. Well, how long do I have to do that for? Until what? They penetrate deep into your spirit. Now, what does that look like? What does that sound like? When the word gets penetrated deep into your spirit, the word starts talking back to you. Anybody ever had a conversation with the word before? <laughs> When your thoughts, when your mind gets so full of the Word of God that it penetrates deep inside of you, the Word starts talking back to you. You'll be in a grocery store. You'll be walking around, and you'll hear the Word because the Word is a person, right? This isn't just a, you know, a little book. This is a real man. He starts talking to you no matter where you are, and that's how you become hearing of what He wants to do. Bless this person. Buy this person's groceries. Well, I don't want to do that. Well, some people aren't even hearing it simply because they're, His Word is not filled up on the inside of them. There's so much that, listen, we think, oh God, I just want to hear you. It's not about you. God is not going to shout from heaven. Come on, everybody, pay attention. This is what I'm doing. He gives you the choice. You and I, we have to go and yield ourselves to fill our minds with His Word. He gave you that choice. But let me encourage you, if you do that and when you do that, look at verse 22. When this happens, then as you unwrap my words, what they'll do? They're going to impart true, come on somebody, true life, joy, abundance of joy, an abundance of peace. It gets added to you. Why? By being in his word. Pastor Marlene told me this this past week. I mean, for her own self, there's, you've been studying the word on healing. You've just been studying it, studying it, studying. And as she's studying it, she's getting healed. Just by being in the Word's presence. You don't have to need some special thing. You get in this, the Word takes care of the rest. And it says, impart true life. And then look, radiant health into the very core of your being. 
As believers, how could we not crave this? This is the answer. Rather than finding out, I got to get all the next medication. I got to get on this. And I, I'm just looking for help in this area and hoping. And that's all fine. If you need that, do that. You need it. Well, I did it. I went to counseling and it was tremendously helpful. Don't be weird. I don't need that. Yes, you do. You need people around you that you can talk to, impart to. Let them speak into your life. You need that. It's vital. It's not just you and God. God gave, yeah, this is a special relationship. It's first. But God gave us other people that He can impart things to us from. You need each other. But then He says, on this case, if you just get into this Word, a lot of problems will be solved right here. Right here. But we kind of go, uh, I'm going to go talk to, you know, this so-and-so, this person's been a real mentor in my life or somebody who's really spoken into my life. And listen, you come to me and start asking different questions and, well, this, my marriage is going like this and my kids are like this and they're just crazy and nuts. How, how's your time with the Lord? Well, I don't got time for this. So we go on. Your answer is right there. I'm not going to be able to fix anything. I can't fix nothing. I'm just Joel. <laughs> just JJ. Just Joel. <laughs> but who can help? He can help, but you got to get with him. You got to let his word get on the inside of you so that he can impart true life. But instead, we're looking for a quick fix. Listen, in the kingdom of God, there is no quick fixes. Because no matter where you go, you bring you with you. Oh, I'm just going to go. I'm going to try another church. I'm going to try another ministry. I'm going to move to a different city. Listen, the problem is, is that you go with you. And as long as you still go with you, you still got the same problems, nothing changes unless the Word, you've unwrapped the Word and it gets on the inside of you, now it's able to impart true life. This is the only way. There's no replacement for faith. There's no replacement for the Word. This is all we got, people. So what do we got to do? We got to hold this in the highest honor and respect that there is. If your marriage is in shambles, get in the Word. If your kids are all over the map, get in the Word. If you are over the map, get in the Word. Where do I start? Start in the New Testament. Because if you read the book of Leviticus, you'll, just, you'll get... You're not quite ready for that yet. <laughs> don't want you killing goats for your marriage. Just, just don't... Let's just. I believe this is helping somebody. I was up early praying in tongues for this message, and I'm believing it's helping. Verse 23. So above all, guard the affections of your heart, for they affect all that you are. Pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being, for from there flows the wellsprings of life. This is where it all happens. So this is why he's saying, guard what you're hearing. Pay attention to what I'm saying, because whatever you're hearing, somebody is feeding you information. Somebody is feeding you something, and it's getting on the inside of you, and the result of you getting it on the inside of you, it's coming out of you. I've never seen people so angry at our Premier Notley. Why are you so angry at a person? They've wrecked your life. She's wrecked your life. Well, the decisions that she made. Then you're again, you are living by what you see. Instead, what do we do? Pray for the woman. Do I agree with everything she's done? No, but that does not stop me from praying for her. Have I screwed up in life before? Oh, yeah. What makes me any better than her? God loves her just as much as she loves me. The same way with Trudeau. People's lives are in shambles because of Trudeau. How can one man screw up your life? Think about that for a moment. How is that possible? It's because we're not living by the word. Can I just, I'm just going to give it to you as it is. This is the reality, is the word has not become our final authority. Meanwhile, Justin Trudeau, Pr Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, we've taken his word as the final authority. Now I'm just angry. It's not, it's not worth it. Let me just encourage you. I plead with you. It's not worth it. So what do we do? We pray for the man. I want him in the kingdom of God. So what happened when his and his family get in? He's got three little kids. What happens? Now what we start doing is we're starting to operate in the light as he is in the light. I want to work with God, not oppose him. As Christians, we're thinking we're doing God a favor by telling how bad somebody is. God is against no one. He's not against anybody. What is he? He is for people. Constantly, always will be. Here's your free choice. So as believers, as Christians, what can we do? We can pray for the man. Pray for those that are hurting you. Your boss, maybe you got a boss who's a real tool. Pray for the man. Pray for the woman. Right? It's not saying you agree with everything they do. But what can you do is you can intercede on their behalf. Lord, I lift them up to you. Lord, help them. They need help. Anyway. That's that. There it is. Okay. What am I talking about? Faith. Um, 
We're placing an importance on hearing the word of God. Because when we hear from him, confidence comes. And the next one, just to finish it off here, we've got a, number one is presumption. So acting without a word, number two then is now passiveness. Is you have heard, but you're not doing. Just because you've heard does not give you the answer. You've got to now respond and act on that behalf. James chapter two, and I'll just look at two verses there. Uh, verse 20. Um, oh, feeble sons of Adam, do you need any further evidence that faith divorced from good works is phony? Uh, let's just read it all, I guess. Wasn't our ancestor Abraham found righteous before God because of his works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Yes. Can't you see how his action cooperated with his faith? And by his action, faith, or what he heard, found its full expression. What you've heard from God needs to be expressed. Right? You can go on, 23. So it is, in this way, the scripture was fulfilled because Abraham believed God, what God shared with him. His faith was exchanged for God's righteousness, so he became known as the lover of God. So now it's clear that a person is seen as righteous in God's eyes, not merely by faith alone, but by his, what? Works. And the same is true with the prostitute named Rahab. Even a prostitute could do this. Who was found righteous in God's eyes by her works, for she received the spies into her home and helped them escape from the city by another route. And lastly, verse 26. For just as the human body without the spirit is a dead corpse, so faith without the expression of good works is dead. Basically, if what you've heard, it needs expression. It absolutely demands expression. And it can come through acting. It could come through your words. It could come from you just, whatever he tells you to do, you just do it. That's kind of it, right? And let me just give you an example. I got about 10 more minutes here. Matthew chapter 14. I want to show you a good example of somebody who's heard it and then did it. But just because you've heard and started doing doesn't mean that it's automatic. You have to stand. You have to continue to stand and continue to fear not. Because when you start acting on something, what God told you, all of a sudden, if you kind of think of it from a natural perspective, this is kind of crazy. Why am I doing this? Don't let fear in. And I want to show you this. Matthew 14, this is right after Jesus fed 5,000 people. And this is immediately right after this. Jesus inst insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was still alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning. Don't you just love when Jesus shows up? Three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. Now I want you to just all of a sudden, you feel the waves coming at you. Man, all of a sudden, this crazy wave, these winds are coming. They're going up and down. They're all over the place. And all of a sudden, they see somebody walking on water towards them. What did they do? It's a ghost. Come on, y'all. What did they do? Ah! It's a ghost! They're freaked right out. Then Jesus right afterwards, <laughs> Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid. Everybody say that together. Don't be afraid. Take courage, I am here. Now, I love this next verse. Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. Now, he's asking to operate in the supernatural. Right here, Lord, if that's you, Lord, tell me to come out of this boat, I'm come to you. Now, until this time, if Peter did not hear the word come, and he tried getting out of the boat, he would sink. Right? Because Peter didn't just jump out, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come. No answer? Okay, I'm going to just try it anyway. Whoop. <laughs> what, what happened? What needed to come first? <laughs> Verse 29. Jesus said, yes, come. What came? Faith. What is he looking for? What is Peter looking for? Lord, I need your word. We've got to be doing this too, people. Lord, what do you want me to do here? I, I need your word on this. Lord, what are you saying about this situation? Me and my wife had a little fight. What do I do about this situation? Rather than me just, I know I've done it before, as I've acted on what I thought it was right, and it just took, spiraled back down. Jesus, what do I need to do here? Because the moment I hear, now I have confidence. He heard the word come. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So Peter went over the side of the boat 
and he walked on the water. Now, just because he heard the words come wasn't automatic. He had to put action to that word come. As soon as he heard the word come, he jumped out over the boat and between Peter's foot and the water is the power of God called faith that was right there. Peter is walking on that word that Jesus told him to come. Isn't that amazing? And I mean, you've, maybe this is for you. You've heard God. He said something to you. You jumped out of the boat. You started walking on what God, you believe God was telling you to do. Now, everything's all good. Everything's all fine and dandy. You are moving forward in what God has asked you to do. Verse 30. Don't think that there's not going to be a fight in this. We are here to fight the good fight of faith. So what came? All of a sudden, the enemy is going to throw storms. He's going to throw waves. He's going to throw curveballs at you in the natural realm to get you off of your faith. Because the moment you let go of your faith and take in fear, it drops. No, no longer are you operating in faith. Fear has now crept in. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified. And notice this, he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached down, grabbed him. He said, you have so little faith. So I, guess I look at this and I see, okay, now this right here, everybody has choking points in their life. Choking points when they believe God. Right here, this night, we actually see Peter's choking point. And you notice this, I think it's kind of cool that this is the book of Matthew. Uh, Luke talks about this reference. But, you know, it says that Peter actually helped Mark, who was potentially a cousin of Peter's. Mark left this scene out because Peter helped him write it. So he didn't want <laughs> his story about me sinking into the book that he was helping write, just for a little fun for you to understand. <laughs> but I'm glad Matthew put it in here because it's a great example for us. But this night we see where Peter's measure of faith was. This is where it is. He could walk on water for a little bit, but then fear came in because he got his eyes off of what God said, what Jesus said, come, and he started to sink. Now notice this, he started to sink in front of Jesus. So we kind of think, well, if Jesus was there, everything should be okay. Not necessarily. The moment you allow fear in, listen, you can't stop fear from coming at you, but you can stop fear from getting in you. Because the moment fear gets in you is you, you dropped your faith. And at that moment, in front of Jesus, Lord, save me, he began to sink. In front of the man, in front of God himself, he began to sink. Oh, how could that be? Why did God let this happen? It's not about God letting it happen. Jesus said, where's your faith? You have so little faith. So we've got to put all this expectation, well, if it was really God's will, he would never have sunk. Not true. Where do you get this theology from? Peter began to sink in front of the master. C can you see this? What happened? It's not just Jesus saying, come, okay, everything's going to be hunky-dory. You have to hold fast to what he told you. Jamie and I, when we were dealing with our oldest son, man, when he was first in his younger age, well, he's still young, but in the two, three years old, he was having so much trouble breathing he would have these attacks where he would just freak out because he can't breathe. What's the first thing that tries to come in? Fear is the first thing that tries to come. So we had to say on a few times, I refuse to fear. You've got to talk this stuff out. All of a sudden you get fired from your job. I refuse to fear. The doctor gives you a bad report. I refuse to fear. Because the moment fear comes in is the moment that the Lord can't get into you anymore. He doesn't have access to you. Are you do you see this? I'm, I really want you to see this. Man, and so what we did is that Jamie and I, when, when Jace was having these little episodes, struggled breathing, freaking out, gasping for air, we had to grab, I refuse to fear. And now the battle, the Lord helped me with this, but my fight is not with that cough or not with that attack. I don't fight. Lungs you, lungs you open up. Lungs you better get open now. I'm fighting now natural things. What am I supposed to hold on to? What he told me. He told me. He gave me Romans 8.11. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells on the inside of you and he's quickening his mortal body. So the fight now that I'm fighting is what he told me. I am standing firm in that. When that episode, when all of a sudden he'd be crying, he'd be yelling. I say, well, I refuse to fear. I will not fear. Somebody, you got to say that. I refuse to fear. Don't give that punk anything. 
You got to get angry about it. You can't just, oh, you know, whatever happens. No, I refuse it. Because what happened, my God told me that the same spirit that lifted Jesus up from the grave, now he dwells in my son. Lord, I want to thank you that that word is true and you're looking after him right now. Even in front of all the episodes. Oh, all these things going on. Jason's screaming, he's yelling. I refuse to fear. Now, where's the choking point? Again, everybody's got this choking point. So what do we do when we experience choking points? Uh, this is it. I, 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 fear just came in. Well, number one is you've got to refuse to fear and feed your faith. Feed it. Get back on the Word. Stick to the Word. What has He told you? Feed it more. Feed it more. Feed it more. Come on, somebody. Say it with me. Feed it more. All of a sudden, fear tries coming in. Well, I don't know where the next paycheck's going to come in. No, 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 no. Feed your faith. We know that it's such a Christian-y saying. Starve your doubts. Starve it. Don't let fear in. I refuse to fear. All of a sudden, something happens. A bad report comes from the doctor. You're not fighting doctors. Thank God. Now you have the facts. There's the facts. But what happens? Fear tries to come in. I refuse to fear. Thank you, doc. I appreciate that. But I'm going to go by what this word says, and I'm holding on to what this is. This is what my God told me. This is how we live. We live by what this word says. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to, I'm done here. Any questions? Because you know what? Like just, he's crafty. The enemy is crafty. He will do everything he possibly can to throw things at you. He knows your loopholes. He knows areas that maybe you'd be struggling in. He knows those things. So you got to pay attention to that. Just understand that. But when he comes, dawn the sun, you don't just go, okay, well, that's just what life is. And oh, please, I just, uh, don't let the fear in. You got to stop it right in the front gate. Ephesians 4.27, the Paul literally is screaming in the Greek, give the enemy no place. Amen. Give him nothing. Don't give him an inch, because the moment you give him an inch, he takes a foot. Give him nothing. How do I do that? I refuse to fear. Come on, let's say that together. I refuse to fear. Again, I refuse to fear. No matter what they said, no matter what, who wins the election, no matter what happens around us, I refuse to fear. Why? Because I give that loser nothing. He doesn't deserve anything. All of a sudden, somebody may come my way, a bad report. I refuse to fear. This is how we fight. Hello again. Thanks for listening. If you live in the central Alberta region of Canada, we would love for you to stop by and hear one of our weekend messages. For any directions, service times, or more information on our children's programming, you can visit us at impactlife.ca. That's impactlife.ca.